It's lovely to be here again, to be with you, to come together around as Yahweh's word as we do. But we come, brethren and sisters, at an exceedingly critical time. There's no shadow of a doubt about that. So what we're planning to do, brethren and sisters, is consider these matters or these subjects in our consideration in the next couple of weeks. We're going to consider the coming king tonight. Then the king's judgment on that evil generation. That's the generation leading up to AD 70. And then in the third class we're going to consider he comes, are we ready? And we're going to look at the rest of chapter 24. And then we're going over to chapter 25 and looking at those three parables. The king's parables of warning to prepare us for his coming. But brethren and sisters, I've tended to rejig things a little bit to give myself a little bit more time because so much is happening at the moment. I think it's highly critical that we look at this seriously. I don't know if you appreciate, but today is almost exactly 100 years since 1914 and the start of the Second, uh, First World War. And the world is exceedingly concerned over what's taking place out there. Here we can see Putin yesterday signing Ukraine as part of Russia. Here he is giving a speech, a speech to the group up there, the rulership of Russia, saying how that he has every right to take what he is taking. And here in Ukraine, they're rounding up the soldiers, arresting them, the Ukrainian soldiers, being rounded up by, no doubt, Russian ones, but in mufti, in so far, there's no sign as to what nation they are from. But look what the papers are saying. Today's statement by Putin showed in high relief what a real threat Russia is for the civilised world. A real threat and international security. So they're exceedingly concerned. Here's Ukraine. Of course, as we can see from those colours, those that are a little bit red are more pro-Russia. More Russian speaking, speak the Russian language and therefore pro-Russia. This area has of course now come under Russian control. The feeling is that surely that will also come under Russian control. But much more than that, as you'll see in a moment. If we go back a little, go back to 2010, here's where the problem arises. Here's Russia's exports. All right? Energy the blue area. In 2010, 65.2% of its revenue came from two products, gas and oil. But since that time, it has changed. It's now that. 74% comes from that. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the industry in Russia has been allowed to run down while Putin has focused on other issues. The Economist magazine, the leading financial magazine in the world, said a few months ago on February the 1st, it put an article on Russia there. It had a few hum humorous pictures. Here's Mr Putin racing to the games. He spent 50 billion more than any, any other games ever seen in the world on that area to put that game and make it the world's best and greatest. But what the article went on to say is he's allowed the Russians to be paid more and more. And what has he produced in Russia so that they can, you know, expand their enterprise and their industry? Nothing. He has been building supermarkets, making the people happy. He has been opening churches that were closed by the uh, Russian, uh, by the Soviets, the communists. Twenty-five thousand three hundred churches across Russia have been. At uh, uh, opened or reopened. He was opening them at one point at three a day. The money's been spent on that and weapons. Weapons. So you can see 65% to 74%. More and more they're dependent on two things, oil and natural gas. And so the economists concluded with this picture. There he goes. There is Russia wrecked chaos because this man is concentrating on producing this sort of thing 
As soon as he came to power, as soon as he came back into power, he said, I'll be doing the biggest rearmament program since the fall of the Soviet Union, 100 new ships, 1,000 new helicopters, tanks galore, you name it. Why? Because he planned to do what we're seeing right now. Planned to do what we're seeing right now. He knew he was digging a hole for Russia. Look at this. Go back a few years. During the time when Iran and Iraq fought each other back in 1985 onwards, oil price collapsed down to this. It reached around about an average of $25 a barrel. And Russia's economy was in a mess. Absolute mess. Russia was utterly crippled because it couldn't get any revenue. So what was the consequence? People were starving. Here they are queuing up for a few loaves of bread, a poor pensioner, nothing's left, looking for milk or something of that nature. Queuing up for it. There's not enough. They're in a desperate plight. And as you well know, there was Russia in those days that held the Warsaw Pact countries and now it had to move out. It couldn't afford to keep it. It shrunk its size by 25% territory-wise, but it lost a huge amount of its industry, which it had in these countries, and we're using their people more as slave labour. If I can exaggerate a little. But that's what was happening, cheap labour. And so now it's in a real mess. It's these countries are dependent on it for its energy. So while the prices are high and why they buy, that's okay. That's okay. But things are changing, changing dramatically. You see, here's Ukraine. And look at the date, last year, Australia Day last year, but don't worry about that, they found huge quantities of shale oil in Ukraine. Massive quantities. The third largest such deposits in Europe and Royal Dutch Shell raced in and said, we'll spend $10 billion to get it out of the ground. it would take us a minimum of four years. So Russia was still relaxing, but they knew that in four years, those pipelines going through Ukraine could easily be turned off and Ukrainian oil and gas go down it. And Russia would become then bankrupt in a moment. They knew that. But they had time, they thought, but they didn't. Six months later, look at the date. Six months later, they found 100 million barrels filled, that's a minimum size of it, in Ukraine. Normal oil. Normal oil. They can get it out, all being well, within about 12 months. We're nearly 12 months now, but chaos is reigning in Ukraine, so that'll slow it right down. That'll start right down, but Ukraine is working to break the Russian grip on its national energy sector and will supply to Europe. Imagine how rich they could have been. So now, what's Russia going to do? Russia then had to stretch its tentacles, move out. It had to guarantee its market for its oil or it's bankrupt. So it pointed the gun at Europe. Russia's military conducts the largest manoeuvres since the Soviet times. 160,000 troops involved. There's Putin. Look at it. Military manoeuvres involving 160,000 troops, 5,000 tanks and so on. The gun was at Ukraine's head and everybody else's head. Make sure you do not change buying our products, oil and natural gas. But I want to look at things now and see where it's gone since that time. I want to look at Europe. Well, of course, we're going to see Russia and see how it's moving in. We're going to look at Ukraine, of course, first of all. Then we're going to look at Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad. Look at that little tiny area there between Lithuania and Poland. It's Russian territory. Russian territory. When the Iron Curtain came down, they did not gain independence. They didn't even look for it. They stayed Russian. Very pro-Russian there. Then we're going over to Moldova here against Ukraine. Then we're going to go over to Serbia down in here. And quite quickly, I might add, so we can get to our studies. But 
Be there as it may. So keep. They wanted to turn to the EU. They wanted to join them. They didn't want to join up with Russia. And so when the talk came that they had to get pay for their debts because Russia had not been buying anything from them since July the 12th, they found that shale oil. They bought nothing more from them. They went into bankruptcy. They said, we're now going to turn off your natural gas. So Ukraine said, let's go across the EU quickly and join up with them. They might be able to help us. And they didn't look like they were going to help quickly. So the Prime President, who's pro-Russian, went up and saw, Ukraine, saw Russia and Russia said, we'll give you a big loan, we'll let you have cheap natural gas, but you've got to join us. And the people said no. Half a million one night. Minus 10, 20 degrees, who knows. Freezing times. In the middle of winter. They're out there protesting. In Independence Square. There's Independence Square. Take a good look at it. Here it is a few hours later. After the protest. Here it is again before. Here it is afterwards. Here it is again before. Look at that. There it is again, sorry. They really, really wanted to make a message, didn't they? We do not want to tie with Russia. No way. But movement has taken place. Russia's got the Crimean Peninsula. Ukraine has been somewhat amputated. The outcome of the referendum in Crimea was never in doubt. Why? Because those people who were going to vote against it didn't vote, they abstained. They knew it was a waste of time. Absolute waste of time. So when you look at the 97% vote, don't believe it. The reason is 83% official turnout was boosted by Russian passport holders and multiple voting. So cheating took place, people who were Russians were voting and as well as that, many of them abstained some 17% because they didn't agree with it. So Russia took over. Are people facing a real threat now? But you see, things are really quite serious. Look at this situation. Date, yesterday. Moscow, television. Ukraine mobilises its army as Kremlin ups the ante with a warning to America. We can reduce you to radioactive ash. Television coming from Oscar. They aren't fooling around. They are saying to America, don't you start moving in here. Or look out, we aren't fooling around here. I'll tell you. We'll use nuclear weapons if we need to. And so, they are deploying. So Ukraine, though, is scared. Ukraine has deployed 40,000 troops, battle-ready soldiers, against Russia's 700,000. They know where they stand. But they're trying to say, don't come into the rest of our territory. Please, please don't. We know where things are going to move. Is Russia standing still and waiting? Was this just one little circumstance? We can see from the oil, no way. So what is she doing? We're now looking at Kaliningrad, Russian territory. Moved high, range, high quality missiles in there. The Russian Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad on Poland's doorstep. Russia said, no we're not. Poland said, you can see them. You can see them. They are moving them in. No shadow of a doubt about it. But some of the highest grade missiles, long range missiles, Russia's got going into Kaliningrad. But they haven't stopped there. Moving in tanks and equipment like that. Russia's deployed three and a half thousand troops plus heavy equipment and tanks into the borders of Poland. They aren't fooling around. They're not dithering. They're acting swiftly. And as well as that, the neighbours, let's go back for a second, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia are scared. They're worried too. Poland more than anybody because they remember what happened under, the Pol under Russia in times past. But Lithuanian armed forces remain in increased combat readiness. They are fearfully worried and they're acting too and preparing. But one of the key commentators in the Australian says, Romanian president says, Moldavia, 
is next in the Soviet expansion. Now remember, Ukraine's here, Moldavia's there. Look at the two colours, just like Ukraine. The darker colour are pro-Russians. They speak Russia. Russia, when they controlled it, put that area into heavy industry and put some of their own people down there. The Russians subsequently, just recently, have gone down there and given all of them a passport to Russia. Not that they want them to leave, but say, you're safe, you're one of us. You're one of us. So here they are, and they fear in Moldavia something else. 1,500 Russian troops already inside that area that had been placed there some time ago. So he fears that the neighbouring Moldavia is in great danger. Russia has these troops in there in this particular area oh, to protect their mates who speak Russian, who we gave passports to. And so this area here quickly moved as it saw things were looking dangerous and said to the EU, can we join fast? And they said, yes. The problem then became immediately. This gentleman here stood up and said, those who want to go Russia's way, join me. And basically the nation was split. The transition to Russian legislation in Transnesia, this area here, is sovereign right based on the wish of its people. So they're saying, we're breaking away anyhow. Already. That's where they're moving. But it's not stopped there, brethren and sisters. Russia's meddling in Bosnia warns Ashton. Vladimir Putin is using the Ukrainian crisis as a cover to launch a power grab in Bosnia. So don't think it's just Ukraine, brethren and sisters. It's not. He's moving everywhere he possibly can. Well, all those games were on. Everybody's centre was intention there. But he's been moving his men in, in, in. Vladimir Putin is using Ukraine as a cover to launch a power grab in Bosnia and it could even risk war in that area. They are extremely concerned. Rioting has already taken place in Bosnia and Herzegovina, highly unemployed area. 40% of them haven't got jobs. Poorly paid region, very unstable. Serbia pro-Russia. Bosnia very terrified of what's going on. It's a frightening situation. The situation that we're seeing developing, brethren and sisters. But it doesn't stop there. Now let's go north of the country. Just slipped my mind, but that area we are talking about before. Into that area to the north, Lithuania, Latvia. And those countries there, brethren and sisters, Estonia. North of Kaliningrad, that's what we were thinking about. Look what they're saying now. And look at the dates, brethren. This is a few days ago. The Baltic states viewed Ukraine crisis with trepidation. Memories of domination by Russia. Then, today, US troops for the Balkan state. America saying we're going to move in. We're going to move into these and support these areas. In a swift reaction to Russia's acceptance of Crimea, America saying we're going to move into that thing. Estonia, Lithuania. I'm not sure they're going to move many. Look at the way Russia's moving to America's moving today. It's pathetic. But then Ukraine sends typhoon fighters to the Baltic states to guard against Russia. So we can see involvement is taking place. They're extremely worried. Extremely worried by all of this. Now we can go on. Sweden has now overnight decided it wants to join NATO and is joining forces with Norway to put troops on the northern border of Norway and Sweden, way up in that cold area where they face Russia. Now, do you think Russia's moving slowly? You need to answer that question and think about this quote. When Russia makes its grand move for building up of its image empire, let the brother and sister then know that the end of all things is at hand. As that as at present constituted is at hand, the long expected but stealthy advent of the King of Israel will be on the eve of becoming a fact. It's wonderful. Who in the world could be joyous about what we've seen but us? But we've got to be ready. We've got to be prepared. We know what's going to happen, don't we? Into that area is going to move Russia. 
It's already moved, brethren and sisters. The future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times and it's underway. It's moved into Ukraine. It's highly likely to go for Poland, Lithuania, Latvia. But one thing's for sure, it's going to head for Turkey. Only last weekend, not uh, the weekend before the last, I was listening to the radio outside because it was a BBC broadcast and they were saying how frightened Turkey is. They're worried. They're worried. Brother Thomas had a comment that he made in Eureka. He said, before Russia takes Turkey, Christ is here. He said, it's my opinion. He was not dogmatic. It's my opinion. But we know how accurate he has been. How long have we got, brethren and sisters? We don't know. But here's something interesting. This takes us back a long time. This is 1941, when Russia and Germany joined together. The brethren and sisters looked at it and they said, oh, goodness me, this looks like Russia, Rosh, and Mago coming together. This is Armageddon. Hooray! And brother Isla Collier, the editor of the Christadelphian, said, no, it's not. World War II is not going to end up in Armageddon. And he was absolutely right. He said this. So maybe we should read a little. At first thought, which arises to, uh, to the mind in a review of past exposition of time periods, it is that it is unwise to make very definite expressions of opinion regarding their fulfilment. So we shouldn't put a date to it. There's no doubt about it. Christ says, no man will know the day nor the hour. But... Whilst it's a mistake to probe too deeply or to speak too confidently regarding the complex subject, it's still worse an error to be indifferent. Faithful disciples of Christ must always be interested in the question, how long? Are we? I hope so. The decree of focus did not give temporal power unto the Pope. Pepin, King of France, came into Italy and conferred it upon the Pope the Exarch of Ravenna and the re, uh, region of Pentapolis, that the commencement of the reign of the Pope as a temporal prince can be justly dated. The date of that event is that, and according to this interpretation, at 1260, and that's an important date. How long have we got? Is this the, co- the date that we're expecting? We don't know. We don't know. A very faithful brother has been writing to me off and on and his dates are up in uh, 2016-17. But be that as may, we're moving into an area of great drama. Great drama. And we need to be prepared. Hence, behold your king cometh. 